morning and this is prateek thanks neerav uh, this is prateek from antique stock broking i welcome you all on behalf of antique stock broking today we have management of all cargo logistics to discuss their third quarter results we have mr ravi jakhar chief strategy officer and mr deepal shah cfo of from the management side without wasting much time i'll hand over the call to the management for opening remarks and then we'll move to question and answer sessions over to you sir Uh, thank you. This is Ravi Jakar here. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's earnings conference call to discuss the performance for the third quarter and the nine months ended December uh, 2020. Along with me, I also have my colleague Deepal. So, to start with, I would request Deepal to first take you through the quarterly financial highlights. Over to you, Deepal. Thank you, Ravi. Let me now take you through the key consolidated quarterly financial highlights. Total revenue from operations stood at 2,735 crores for the third quarter, as compared to 1,787 crores for the corresponding quarter last year, which is an increase of approximately 53.1 percent. EBITDA for the quarter was at 147 crores, as against rupees 126 crores during the corresponding period last year, which is an increase of. 16.8 percent on YOY basis. Profit after tax was reported at 1.4 crores for the quarter. Let me also highlight the performance for nine months of the financial year FY21. The total revenue from operations to that rupees 7,149 crores for the nine months of the year, as compared to rupees 5,475 crores for the corresponding period last year, which is an increase of approximately 30.6 percent on a YOY basis. EBITDA for the first nine months of the year ended uh, stood at rupees 4,441 crores, as against rupees 3,000 sorry rupees 397 crores. Corresponding period last year, which is an increase of 11 percent on YOY basis. Profit for the uh, profit after tax for the first nine months of the year ended was reported at rupees 89 crores, as against 180 crores during the corresponding period last year, which is an decrease of 50.5 percent on YOY basis. Just like to inform you that this year onwards, we have uh, from April onwards, we have uh, consolidated gati um, in our results. Um, so that is what you have to take into account while uh, looking at these results. Now, I would like to hand over to Ravi to take you through the key business segment highlights for the quarter. Over to you, Ravi. Thank you, Deepal. Uh, coming to the business highlights for the quarter, let me start with the MTO segment. The shortage of containers and supply constraints on the shipping side continue to exist, and that are uh, driving the freight rates higher, which creates challenges on the procurement front. But on the uh, good side, it's also an indication of overall economic environment, which continues to improve across the globe, and therefore provides a good opportunity to the business. At EQ Worldwide, our uh, global subsidiary on MTO business. We continue to drive innovation through products such as Accelerate, which is a combination of C. And AI, and we also continue to significantly focus on digitization through products such as EQ360. On the financial side, there has been a marginal uh, decrease in the return on capital employed, primarily on account of higher working capital, which is naturally driven by higher freight rates. On an overall basis, the multimodal transport operations clocked a total volume of over 207,000 TUs for the third quarter of the financial year. The total revenue for the third quarter ended was rupees two thousand one hundred and forty-seven crores, as against one thousand six hundred and fifteen crores for the corresponding period last year, which is an increase of about thirty-two point nine percent. This is primarily, as I mentioned, driven by higher freight rates prevalent across the globe. On the EBIT side, we achieved fifty-seven point nine crores for. Uh, the quarter as against 57.5 crores for the corresponding period last year, which is a marginal increase of 0.69 percent. EBIT margin stood at 4.3 percent. Coming to our project and engineering solutions business, the total revenue for the third quarter stood at rupees 82 crores as against 70 crores for the corresponding period last year, 
with a growth of 17.1 percent. Project Logistics EBIT reported at 1.8 crores for the quarter. The segment has seen uh, relatively limited growth in order book, but business continues to be steady. Focus on infrastructure growth and development of new metro projects announced in the, uh, this year's budget is likely to provide good opportunity in future. We believe that the government will continue to focus on infrastructure expenditure to revive uh, economy, and therefore there would be more capital projects, more infrastructure projects, which would lead to greater opportunity for crane business as well as for the project logistics business. On the crane utilization side, we have seen steady improvement since May, and now we are almost at par or even better on sometimes when you do a year in year comparison. Company, as you mentioned in the past also, is focused on rationalizing its fleet to make the overall fleet younger. And just to highlight, in this business, we generally see a lower ROC, which is primarily driven by significant amounts of depreciation on the equipments, which drive a bit to a much lower number. Coming to our logistics path business, the total revenue for the third quarter ended was at rupees 17.8 crores as against rupees 11.8 crores for the corresponding period last year with a growth of 50.8%. This is primarily driven by new warehouses which got developed and ready and leased out to various tenants. The development and construction of logistics path is going on schedule. There was a minor disruption in the early couple of months of uh, COVID pandemic but since then, we have been steady in whatever new construction was happening across various sites. Lease income from warehouses naturally continues to rise, and the trend will continue as more and more warehouses get developed. As we have informed in the past, for this vertical, we also have got into an agreement for a definitive transaction, which will reduce our shareholding to a strategic minority holding of 10%. That transaction has seen some delays due to COVID-led delays in certain approvals, which were part of condition precedent. However, the work is in progress now, and we are confident that it should get concluded with some delays. Coming to our CSS and ICD business segment, the total volumes for the third quarter of financial year 2021 were 81,666 DUs. The total revenue for the third quarter ended stood at 108.8 crores, marginally lower than 111.3 crores for the corresponding period last year. However, uh, efficiencies on the operation side uh, helped us improve the EBIT, which stood at 31.3 crores as against 27.8 crores for the corresponding previous period last year. There has been a recovery in volumes across all locations over the past several months. Both volumes have registered good growth in the uh, exam segment. And uh, on the challenges side, the same thing which we spoke about on the shipping, shortage of containers, some blank sailings, and higher freight rates have impacted the trade, and which does impact the CFS ICD business as well. The ROC for the business continues to be healthy. Uh, this is a quick update from our side on all the businesses. Thank you very much, and we are open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and one. The first question is from the line of Vikram Suryamanshi from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good morning, sir. Uh, can you repeat the volume uh, for MTO business uh, for the quarter? Yeah, so the volume for the MTO business is over 207,000. Uh, to use. Okay, and uh, the rates what we have seen in uh, quarter uh, freight rates, particularly for MTO, I think uh, the, uh, there has been further increase in uh, uh, basically uh, rates for the, this quarter also or uh, in uh, January, February. So the uh, kind of index we get uh, for the full container load freight rate, 
it does have similar increase we have seen in uh, ltl uh, also or ltl the rates would be uh, the increase or uh, the quantum of uh, uh, rate hike would be lower than what we have seen in the index uh, container index rate yeah no so what happens is uh, in the lcl space which is less than container load naturally you are on the procurement side we are blocking the same container space from the shipping line and therefore we have to pay the same freight rate which would pay for an fcl they do not differentiate between an lcl and an fcl container in that sense so naturally the freight rates which have gone up have gone up for all across now uh, there are uh, positive and negatives in the freight rate when it comes to impact on our business because on one side like i mentioned the procurement becomes challenging but then we are uh, mostly often able to pass on the incremental cost to the end customer as well so therefore our uh, gross margins are usually protected and that is how this business which you know uh, always sees if not globally which is the trend right now at least on some trade lanes you always find some volatility in the freight rates so the business fundamentally focuses on uh, the gp when uh, driving the business performance and therefore you would notice that uh, the uh, significant increase in freight rates neither leads to a significant downward trend because of higher procurement costs nor does it lead to incremental benefits because of uh, higher revenue the only thing which happens is it skews the percentages in terms of proportions so that is the way to analyze you can look at the on the uh, on the uh, ebit level when you would see the if the uh, if we are able to hold on the ebit but the revenue rises significantly because of higher freight rates you would typically find that the ebit margin appears to be lower and when the freight rates normalize our ebit would remain same but the freight rates and therefore the revenue would come down and therefore the ebit percentage margins would go up just to explain uh, how to look at the numbers okay and uh, basically uh... can you share the absolute or uh, utilization uh, level currently and uh, project and engineering and uh, do we have any order book uh, growth right now because i think this time we could not get the presentation so if you can share the uh, utilization uh, rate as well as the order book yeah so we'll be uh, we'll upload the presentation uh, today so we can get all the details there but just to broadly highlight the utilization levels over the last uh, couple of months has varied from uh, 68 69% to about 78 79% so on an overall basis these numbers have been higher than uh, where we were so not just in the preceding month but also in the uh, previous year what we have also done is as we continue to rationalize our fleet what you typically find is the number of cranes would reduce but these are typically younger uh better more in demand kind of strength and we also uh hire some cranes from outside to meet our uh, client requirements because uh, people prefer to uh take services from all cargo driven our uh, focus on uh, safety and service standards so therefore we are moving towards a, a, a situation wherein let's say 80 85% of the part train is our own but maybe we have a 15 20% of capacity supplied from outside as well so that uh, we can maintain high utilization of trains and make the business more profitable so there is uh, one thing which we are doing and which has helped us uh, significantly over the last few quarters despite the challenges in the covid pandemic we have been able to increase our utilization and also in comparison to most of the key uh, competitors in the market our train utilization levels would be a uh, higher got it thank you sir thank you ladies and gentlemen you may press star and one to ask a question the next question is from the line of ashwini agarwal from ashmore investment please go ahead uh hi deepal <coughs> uh, a uh, couple of i mean i was just looking at the numbers you know on a year on year and quarter on quarter basis and i accept that uh, you know the mto business one has to look at ebit per container rather than look at it as a percentage of revenue but there's been a meaningful decline over the september quarter can you give us some color as to what happened uh, why is this uh, you know ebit number down from almost 80 crores down to 58 crores uh, september versus december um ravi you want to take that or should i answer yeah. that 
I like that. Take that reason. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, basically, yeah. Hi. So basically, what happens in this business is there are two things which uh, drive this. Uh, first, uh, the business has seasonality. So if you look at the historic numbers as well, your year-end uh, payments to staff, etc., are relatively high, and therefore your uh, staff cost goes up. And therefore, when you look at the EBIT level, you would find that there's an impact. And this is a seasonality which comes in because in our global business EQ worldwide, unlike the India business which runs on April to March budgeting, the international business runs on a January to December budgeting. And therefore, the October to December quarter is the last uh, quarter for the budget year, and which is where some incremental costs are there, which are annualized, annual in nature. So that's one reason. Secondly, as we have tried to become more lean and uh, efficient in the, uh, in the business processes use of, by use of technology, it means that we have been able to reduce headcount, but as you know, driven by various regulations, the reduction in headcount also comes along with uh, severance costs. And therefore, those severance costs have also impacted the bottom line, and there have been some uh, one-time expenses as well on the transformation initiatives and some technology initiatives. So these are few factors attributing to incremental uh, costs and therefore a uh, relative impact on the uh, bottom line. So Ravi, just to add, um, so what happens is that uh, though the current quarter, because of the surveillance cost, there could be a little bit of a higher uh, impact on the PNL. But uh, going forward, um, those savings will, will add up and, uh, you know, will finally be shown in the bottom line. So it's an ongoing exercise where we're trying to reduce our manpower and, um, you know, digitize some of our processes. Yeah. And the other thing, I don't know whether uh, Deepal, you mentioned it or Ravi mentioned it, uh, but you spoke about higher working capital uh, requirements because of higher shipping freight rates. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean... I was always under the impression that, uh, you know, this is uh, a business that, uh, you know, kind of has matched cash flows. You pretty much collect when you when a customer books a container and uh, the shipping lines give you a small amount of credit. So there isn't really much working capital involved in the MTO business. Uh, but uh, your comment seems to indicate otherwise. Could you help me understand why? Yeah, so basically what happens is, you know, so uh, as compared to the other businesses, naturally there isn't uh, very high amounts of working capital in all these businesses. So like you rightly put it, uh, we get credit from shipping lines and we extend credit to our customers, but there's always a small marginal gap in that, and which is where the working capital comes into play. Now in today's time, there are historic highs on certain trade lanes on uh, the ocean freight that has uh, impacted the working capital. But at the same time, so the impact on the working capital, on the ROC because of uh, working capital would be uh, less than 1%. And this is transient, I am assuming. Yeah, so you know, this would, this would uh, change. So, you know, so we believe that the, I mean, of course, uh, nobody knows for sure, but based on our experience and what we gather from our uh, operations and business teams, we believe that over the next four to five months, the situation should get better. We do not anticipate the freight rates to go back to the old normal. They may continue to remain at a certain delta above the historic rates, but they would certainly uh, soften a bit in the coming four to five months. And then as the freight rates uh, go down, naturally the working capital will get released back and therefore your, uh, you know, your uh, capital employed also will again shrink. And naturally um, any overdraft facilities etc also get reduced so margin and improvement in this cost also. Ravi, it's also a factor of that container shortage which will get eased out in the coming quarter. So probably the impact of that on the freight rates will, will subside. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. How does the container shortage impact uh, working capital? Well, it impacts the freight rate. So price the freight rates up so uh, okay. your working capital gets expanded. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, th that was the other question that, you know, on the container availability side, are you seeing any respite or things continue to be as bad as they were through the October to December period? No, so things have been improving uh, significantly. Also, uh, you know, the current ongoing period when there's been a bit of, you know, uh, though it's not been like every year, but there's definitely been 
a certain break to the Chinese New Year. So a lot of shipping lines are using this window to reposition the containers and remove the imbalances which had occurred. So the situation is uh, certainly improving on the container shortage side also, and also with new containers coming in. So it is definitely uh, not as difficult as it was uh, even three months ago to source the containers. So the situation is improving uh, well on that front. And in the next three to four months, we believe that the system should be in control. Okay. Thank you so much and all the best, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Vikram Suryavanshi from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, thanks for uh, again opportunity for the question. Uh, on the CFS side, uh, number uh, volume number, what I have got is eight one six one six. Is that right uh, number? And uh, second thing, uh, are we how we are seeing the trend in uh, ground rent, which was quite a significant component during COVID time and uh, trade disruption? How that is uh, now uh, in terms of uh, revenue share and uh, even. Uh, we had uh, seen that a lot of DPD uh, uh, clear containers which was going back to the CFS, uh, that proportion was also significantly increased when trade was disturbed. So how is the share of uh, DPD containers which are again going back to CFS compared to uh, peak in uh, COVID time? And is it uh, impacting the overall profitability or is, has it normalized? Or structurally, are we seeing that uh, uh, the profitability has now improved compared to pre-COVID uh, time for CFS business. Yeah, so I would say that as far as the DPD containers are concerned, they continue to benefit from the existence of CFSs and that uh, trend continues. On the ground, the rental side, uh, naturally, the situation in the month of uh, last week of March and through the month of April was very different when there was a very strong lockdown in place and therefore containers were not being evacuated. That situation had very well eased by June or July itself, and now from an operation standpoint, it is uh, completely back to normal. There are no uh, visible uh, impacts of pandemic as far as the storage or movement of containers is concerned. So it is pretty much like how it was uh, pre-COVID. And uh, can you reconfirm the number or volume number? Yeah, the uh, volume numbers are um, 81,666 for the quarter FI21. Okay, sir. Oh, okay, sir. And uh, if you can give uh, within CFS, uh, the NPT is uh, running at what capacity utilization? Because I think uh, out of two uh, CFS, one uh, predominantly we are using for like a uh, additional value added services or catching to uh, DPD shares. So, how is the uh, combined utilization at JNPT and uh, what kind of uh, recovery we are seeing at JNPT? So, uh, JNPT utilizations have been uh, more or less same as uh, last year. Now, we expect the volume should continue to uh, improve over last year, therefore, the utilization level should go up, considering the dwell time remains same. Only for the temporary phase during the early part of the pandemic, the utilization levels had increased significantly because the CFSs or choker blockage containers are not moving out. Now they've been normalized. But uh, apart from uh, Kolkata, which is a relatively new facility and therefore would only see a steady uh, buildup of business, uh, GNPT and Dadri continue to be at par. In Chennai, we have uh, uh, seen some good traction. So overall, uh, it is, uh, I would say, marginally better than the last year. Okay. On, on, on as of today's status, yeah. Okay, and one last question on MTO, the kind of volume growth what we have seen, uh, is it large part uh, of uh, that because of uh, uh, full container or uh, LCL was also seen the similar kind of growth rate? It is a combination of uh, both. We do not distinguish between the quantity as we sell uh, both LCL and FCL to our customers. Okay, now, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashwini Agarwal from Ashwar Investments. Please go ahead. 
So it's partly related to uh, the previous uh, question. Uh, could you give us a breakup between full container and less than container load uh, in that in the in the in the number of uh, TUs that you carried over the quarter? So we do not, uh, you know, uh, share the breakup on the FCN and LC. We have always treated them as uh, one unit. That's how we, the procurement and the sales to customers also happens. So we have maintained them as uh, as one common business operator and EQ worldwide. The empty Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of VP Rajesh from Banyan Capital Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. My question was regarding the delisting process. Uh, you know, if you can comment on, uh, on the delay that we are seeing in uh, process moving forward. And relatedly, the transaction that you mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, will that impact the timeline of the delisting as well? So uh, delisting and uh, the transaction I mentioned about are two separate uh, uh, issues, not connected to each other. Delisting is a promoter issue, while the transaction is uh, is a company matter. As far as the transaction is concerned, uh, it is uh, under progress. On the delisting side, as a from a process perspective, the shareholder approval had come through. And now the next step is for promoters to arrange the funds and then make a formal application for delisting. It is not possible for the company to comment on where the promoters' fundraising initiatives or uh, funding arrangements are uh, in place and you know when they would uh, be able to make an application for the formal application for the delisting. So it is not possible for the company to comment on that. Fair enough. And my second question is on the business front. Uh, would you say that uh, you're back to 80-90% of the pre-COVID levels? Or if you can just give some color on that side, you know, division by division, uh, how, how, do you, how are you seeing the near-term trends? Yeah, so if I speak about situation as of today, in the MTO business, we are uh, doing as good as last year. I do not see any shortfall. In some places, we are perhaps doing marginally better. In CFS business, we are, uh, again, from a business performance standpoint, we are doing uh, better than last year as of today's status, if I speak about that. On the project and engineering division, on the crane equipment rental, we are doing better than last year. On the project logistics, we believe that things should improve in the coming year. Last uh, six, eight months have not been uh, that strong for new projects or uh, you know what we believe in the coming six to nine months. Things should improve. So it, we are definitely below maybe at a 70% uh, level in, in, in that business on the project logistics, but that should uh, revive in the coming few quarters. And so, so overall, business, uh, I would say, is uh, at par or stronger than last year on today's basis. Okay. And on the crane side, uh, uh, the utilization is pretty low uh, in the industry from what we understand. Um, what is your view on that business? Yeah, so while there is no verified third-party data that we can refer to, our broad understanding is that industry-wide utilization levels vary from 50 to 60 percent. But in our case, we have been able to keep them north of 70 percent for uh, most part of the time. And that is primarily driven by our high service levels and significant focus on uh, safety, which is valued by the customers. And therefore, there's a preference for our equipment, uh, and which allows us to uh, maintain uh, high utilization levels. We have also, over the last several quarters, been focused on uh, rationalization of fleet, ensuring that we keep uh, the right screens which fit our customer requirements uh, well. So keeping customers the center of uh, the business has allowed us to uh, have higher utilization levels in the crane rental business. Great. And uh, lastly, on the yield side, uh in the cranes, uh, what is the yield we are getting? Is it getting better? Is the pricing getting better? Or what's the situation there? So the yield was, in, I would say, was certainly at a significant uh, low six, eight months ago. But it has been steadily increasing over the last uh, five, six months. 
and we expect that there could be another uh, maybe about 5 to 10 percent upside which may still uh, happen in the coming uh, six months or so okay thank you so much i appreciate it thank you the next question is from the line of ankit panchmatya from bnk securities please go ahead uh, hi uh, uh, good morning and thanks for taking my question uh so my question is uh, more to do regarding uh, uh the cfs business uh, how are we looking at this business uh, because uh, 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 the ground rents are not there, I believe, in this current quarter. And do we see uh, the uh, per TU metrics to be sustainable at these numbers? And we were kind of providing some value-added services on this uh, side of business. So uh, do we see that the segment has bottomed here and we would see some better days ahead with respect to the realization or the per TU profitability, which uh, which we are looking at, at it? Yeah, so I see that your question itself has the answer to the question as well. You spoke about the evaluated services. That is the way to go to find more opportunities, see what more can be done, what more can also be permitted. So we'll continue to see the policy also uh, shape up from the government side. Government is working on the national logistics policy. We'll see what uh, CFSs can do more and benefit from uh, the government's uh, outlook towards facilitating trade. In terms of you spoke about the per TU, yes, uh, as the ground rent comes down, you may see a uh, marginal decline in uh, per TU realization, but that is something which you have seen as already kind of bottomed out, you know, and uh, it is likely to only get marginally better. What also we need to recognize is that as the trade continues to grow, the capacity on the port side is uh, significantly available with the new terminals, uh, which are still not fully utilized. While on the CSS ICD side, the government has uh, taken the right initiatives on zoning various uh, locations and therefore ensuring that there's not excess uh, supply which leads to uh, a situation of uh, discomfort for uh, the economy and trade at, uh, traders at large. So therefore, uh, what it means is that the ability to compete better and handle more TUs goes up because if my uh, container yard can hold 4,000 TUs, for example, and if the dwell time is 15 days, it can handle 8,000 TUs. But if the dwell time goes down to 10 days, the same container freight station can now handle 12,000 TUs. So ability to handle higher TUs negates down the reduced uh, earnings from the ground rent as the dwell time goes down. So on an overall basis, we believe there are good opportunities for growth by attracting higher volume, making use of uh, the reduced dwell time, offering value-added services, and trying to see how we can make the operations more efficient. Right. So just to understand this, this quarter does not have any ground rent, right? So this is the this is the performance without any ground rent in the current quarter. You mean to say any abnormal ground rent? Yes, there isn't any any abnormal. Like abnormal. Yeah, there aren't abnormal... Uh, the, yeah, so the business has operated in a normal environment for the last three months. There haven't been any significant abnormalities in the business operation. Ravi, uh, just to add here, so a uh, normal, it, it's uh, all 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 CFS billings have ground rent, but these are normal ground rents as per normal dwell time of the container. Yes. Any undue abnormal which was seen in the first quarter is not there, just to make it amply clear. Yeah? Right, right. And uh, 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 on the transaction with the Blackstone, how much amount uh, we have already received, uh, is there any amount over this quarter which we have received, and uh, uh, any any clarity on the same would be would be much helpful? Yeah. So the uh, the amount from Blackstone uh, is going to be 380 crores, as originally mentioned in the agreement. Out of which, around 238 is what we have received. 142 is due. That amount is expected as in we close the uh, conditions uh, precedent, which we are about to close in a couple of months from now. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, this proceeds are expected to be uh, uh, focused towards reduction of debt or how debt. we plan yes. to... Yes, it will be focused towards reduction of debt. Uh, Deepal, if you can mention what would be the current debt uh, uh, figure we have, gross debt. 
yes um so our current debt levels uh, you want console or you just want all cargo uh, all cargo stand alone hello yeah console console is ready yeah so uh, console including gati um, uh, at the net level is around 1300 crores at the gross level it will be around close to 1600 crores because we do always carry some cash right as treasury right great great thanks yeah. thank you anyone who wishes to ask a question you may press star in one the next question is from the line of ashwini agarwal from ashwar investments please go ahead uh hi uh, just one more question on the ps side uh, we've seen your uh, you know asset side come down a lot as a result of probably uh, both depreciation and asset disposal is this balance sheet now um, sort of at a stage where we can expect it to remain steady or do you have more uh, reductions planned in mind so uh, the way to look at the numbers would be to focus on the depreciation amount the depreciation amount would uh, either remain same if no further equipments are sold or the depreciation amount going down will primarily be on account of some trend being sold which means your asset value will further go down so therefore whatever trend you see in terms of reduction in uh, book value the same trend is likely to continue because either the same amount of depreciation will happen or depreciation plus uh, an additional amount because most often when we uh sell the equipment it is usually higher than book value we are able to realize in most cases so, so actually what i was trying to understand was that are you now happy with the assets that you have or do you still have identified surplus assets in the project and engineering space that you wish to sell no we we do have uh, we need to uh, you know we may still have to reduce some more assets from the uh, pne segment and the increase in the mto net assets uh, roughly about 220 crores year on year most of it is working capital or have you invested in capex as well and if you can give us you know what are your capex working plans capital is primarily working capital primarily working capital okay all right guys okay all the best thank you a reminder to all the participants you may press star and 1 to ask a question the next question is from the line of pratik kumar please go ahead hello yeah i have two questions firstly uh, on the mto operate in the mto operations uh, there was some government subsidy support which like had inflated our numbers in q1 and to some extent in q2 is that impact now behind uh, or is it still contributing to our profits yeah so q1 had a significant uh, support from the government q2 was far more reduced and q3 is uh, almost not material uh okay and is it possible to uh, quantify the the one off impact of staff uh, uh, staff cost uh, including severances which has been paid uh, during the quarter uh, which will not have like any impact in q4 so i would say ballpark uh, number which we can uh, provide for severance cost or a couple of other one off cost could be in the range of about 1.5 to 1.6 uh, million us dollars thanks uh, and uh, one question on cfs segment uh, uh so uh, i understand there are like few cfs is which uh, which are licenses for them are up for renewal uh, probably of the land or in general uh, so does our cfs also gets impacted due to that uh, or we still have like leases for few years no we have no such concerns in our business uh and lastly uh, what is the capex which we have done for the 9 months uh, for this year Do you like to answer that? 
um, yeah, so uh, primarily we have spent around close to uh, 300 odd crores on construction. Now, other than that, we don't have hardly uh, maintenance capex of around 10 to 20 crores. So this construction capex will be refunded to us uh, by Lakshmi? Yes. yes. Uh, and when that would happen? Uh, post the closure of this deal, right? Yes, like we mentioned in earlier in the call that uh, there are certain CPs which need to be completed, uh, which we expect to complete in the next couple of months. Uh, it got extended because of COVID, and uh, once we complete this, so we will receive the rest of the money. Uh, so just to understand the balance sheet, FY21 balance sheet, uh, assuming this deal doesn't get closed within March, will have this higher capital expend expenditure in our cash flow. Yes, so we if uh, we are able to complete the CP before March end, uh, which uh, seems a little unlikely, then if it happens, then of course the, balance, uh, the amount will be received and the balance sheet will shrink accordingly. But uh, if that doesn't, it will jump over to the next quarter. And so we will see the balance sheet shrink uh, by end of uh, June uh, uh, 21. Uh, and, uh, and are we also looking to like... Uh so, for uh, uh, improving Gati's operations and restructuring operations there, do you understand? Are we also like sort of, I mean, yeah, so adding, on, to so adding on Gati's side, funds there? Yeah, Ravi, yeah, take it over. Yeah, so on Gati's side, we have been, uh, you know, as uh, we have spoken separately on Gati calls as well, we have been going through a tremendous transformation exercise there, which encompasses everything from operations to uh, sales, technology, people, processes, everything is being uh, transformed. In terms of CapEx requirements, uh, we do not foresee very significant uh, amounts to be required. Uh, whether uh, some, uh, some reasonable incremental CapEx would be required, we would get to know in the next three to six months as we you know, evaluate various opportunities and take various business decisions. But nothing very significant or substantial. Uh -huh. Thanks, I'll get back to you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vikram Suryavanshi from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, can you give clarity on this uh, minority interest of uh, close to 12.6 crore in this quarter, which is uh, significantly different than the uh, previous quarter? Uh, and uh, how is the outlook on our contract logistic business? Uh... So, deeply, if you can answer the question. Yeah, the minority interest is uh, typically it's different because it, the minority interest depends on the profit. So there have been changes in the Gati results in the from the previous quarter to this quarter. That's the reason the minority interest has changed accordingly. We hold only 46 percent uh, of Gati balance goes into minority uh, interest. That is one large piece. Rest, of course, we have minority uh, interest in some other holdings also, which are very minuscule. So at a control level, when we give the profit, the profit includes uh, as 100% stake, and then we, as an accounting policy, uh, the minority interest is reduced from uh, the profit at the end. Or if it's a loss at the minority, it is added back. That is how it works. Yeah. That's the difference. So Gati announced some exceptional items in their uh, PNL. That's the reason the minority interest has substantially uh, changed over the previous quarter. All right. And how is that outlook on the contract logistics business? Yeah, so yeah. the contract logistics business, uh, we primarily operate in uh, four key domains, which is uh, chemical, uh, auto and spare parts, e-commerce, and then uh, the other verticals, uh, other industries. So chemical, we have had a strong presence uh, since last many years, and that continues to be the case. However, from a growth perspective, we see that uh, E-commerce is the biggest driver of growth because that's where the maximum opportunity uh, lies and with the significant expansion of the entire e-commerce uh, retail trade in the country. So we are bullish about the business. Business should continue to perform well. Uh, but from a vertical-wise perspective, we believe that while some of the conventional verticals for us like chemical, which is, of course, the largest uh, vertical right now, would continue to witness steady uh, performance and some marginal growth, uh, other verticals like e-commerce may drive growth significantly.
Uh, okay and how uh, because we have that our such ci uh, contract logistic business and even gatti has i think uh, some contract logistic business so going forward are these significantly different uh, domain uh, within the uh, different industries or is there any uh, way we can consolidate this business yeah so for avashya ci contract logistics is the mainstay business and the key business we have uh, supply chain management business in gati also but in gati's context there is uh, relatively smaller however what uh, happens on the business front is we try to derive synergies across the two and see wherever they can benefit from each other whether it is in uh, terms of uh, uh, sharing work or knowledge in the background or uh, finding some synergies at the customer end as well in terms of uh, customer segment Yes, they are slightly different. As at Avasha TCI, we are historically focused on the capital vertical and auto and spares uh, has been the second vertical, and e-commerce is the growing vertical. While uh, Gati's business is mostly around uh, consumer durables and IT products. Okay, that was helpful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of VP Rajesh from Banyan Capital Advisors. Please go ahead. Yes, to follow up on the PEF decision, uh, you said you are planning to sell some more assets. Can you quantify the amount of that? So uh, I would say that you know uh, we would.